We are very honored today to have uh, Professor Goodwin here to give us a talk. This is a joint meeting of the uh, Tri-State Classes Club's March meeting and uh, CAER's Field Science Seminar. Uh, Professor Goodwin uh, got his BS in Chemical Engineering from Clemson University and uh, got his Master's in Chemical Engineering from Georgia Tech University and uh, got his uh, PhD from University of Michigan. And he joined the University of Pittsburgh uh, and he did his postdoc in French Catalysis Institute and uh, he joined the University of Pittsburgh uh, as a faculty uh, in 1980 and uh, has served as a uh, department of chair at uh, uh, Chemical and Petroleum Engineering Department. And from 1980 to 2000, uh, he is now with uh, Clemson University and uh, his uh, department of chair for the chemical engineering. Mm, welcome. Let's start out by trying to avoid the microphone. If you have trouble hearing, let me know and I'll use the microphone. If not, uh, I'll avoid it because I'm not that, that ambidextrous uh, with the pointer and the, the slide. Uh, I thank uh, Yongting for uh, inviting me and uh, it's a real pleasure to visit uh, uh, CAER today and of course to, to see uh, or to speak before the Tri-State Catalysis Society. Um, I chose uh, for a topic uh, something that I know that uh, certainly the people here uh, at CAER are very interested in and that is uh, cobalt catalyst, particular cobalt fissure tropes catalyst. And what I'll be talking about today is cobalt support compound formation in cobalt-based catalysts. And I'd like to point out uh, my, two of my PhD students, the, the student whose work uh, I'll be primarily talking about is Bhutra Zhang Fengjit, and uh, Jungjai Panpanat uh, was the person who did the Raman spectroscopy that I'll be showing a little bit later. Now, just in the way of background, uh, certainly those of you who are working in the fissure tropes area or have been working in the fissure tropes area will know some of this, but for those uh, others of you, uh, cobalt catalysts are highly preferred for fissure tropes uh, since this is based on natural gas because it's uh, probably the most active fissure metal. Uh, it is also highly selective for long chain uh, paraffins and that's of course the route that everybody wants to go today. In addition, something that I left off here, it is uh, not very active for water gas shifts and certainly at the temperatures used or where it's very active for fissure it doesn't have much water gas shift activity. And this is why, of course, uh, it is preferred for natural gas because the, uh, you don't want to waste your carbon. Uh, cobalt fissure tropes catalyst uh, can come in a wide variety and certainly there are a lot of patents in the literature. Uh, ultimately, although you can find cobalt on strain supports, basically it comes down to uh, most of the catalysts that are contemplated being used, or are being used, or will be used, are based on uh, uh, supported catalysts where the cobalt is supported on either alumina, silica, or titania in some form. Uh, the other thing that's well known is that uh, if you promote these catalysts with a little bit of noble metal, uh, it aids in lowering the reduction temperature, and this gives you a more highly dispersed or more highly dispersed uh, catalyst. And since cobalt catalyst uh, or cobalt fissure tropes catalysis is really all about getting a high cobalt metal surface area, the catalysis is only being done on the cobalt metal atoms. Now, one issue, obviously, since we are putting cobalt on a support, it's been known for, oh, for a long time that when
when metals are sitting on supports, you can get interactions with that support. And, and the, probably the worst kind of interactions are actually forming compounds with the support. And there's been tons of studies uh, uh, on uh, nickel supported, uh, supported nickel catalysts. And nickel silicates have been discussed and studied uh, for 30 odd years or more. But uh, cobalt also can form compounds with alumina and silica. Uh, these cobalt support compounds are inactive for fissiotropes. And what is known uh, and has been uh, more explored in the last uh, number of years is that water vapor plays a very key role in the formation of these cobalt support compounds especially cobalt aluminate and cobalt silicate. Now, the unfortunate thing is that water is a byproduct of both the reduction of the original catalyst, that is, the reduction of the original calcine catalyst, and it's a byproduct of reaction. So this potentially can always play a major role, uh, since you've always got water around, you certainly always have to consider this compound formation. And in fact, along with uh, carbon deposition, which is another major source of catalyst, a cartoon or, or a little schematic maybe, to just show the kinds of effects that one has to deal with, and in fact that uh, some of the people in the room here are already dealing with, uh, cobalt in some ways is almost too good a catalyst. It's so good a catalyst that it's too active. And by being too active, it becomes very delicate when you're going through startup procedures because very easily can you get uh, exotherming and this creates problems because it throws you up into a higher temperature regime where you get a lot of carbon deposition, leads to early deactivation of the catalyst before you really start the process. But if you look at a sort of general plot, and uh, most runs of cobalt catalysts look something like this, there's, there's obviously some startup procedure. This startup procedure may take a few hours, or it may take a few days. It really depends on, on how you're trying to start it, what's the size of the reactor you're starting it in, et cetera. And there will be sort of a break-in period where often you get a, a rather rapid uh, decline in activity to a more constant level. And then uh, even there, it's not a perfectly flat line, and you get some deactivation with time on the stream over a long period of time. And the startup procedure is very key because whether you start up here or you start down there may be tied very closely to how careful you are in your startup procedure. And that startup procedure, if you back it up a little bit through the reduction cycle, uh, how you reduce the catalyst may also have an impact on where you start uh, the reaction, or what level you start the reaction rate at. But even if you do the reduction in the same way, the startup procedure, uh, flight differences, uh, uh, cases where you perhaps uh, try to go to temperature too fast, uh, you'll very quickly see exothermic in the reactor. Even large-scale flurry phase reactors, you can often see exothermic uh, happening. So cobalt catalysts, being very good catalysts, but very delicate catalysts in a way, have to be closely understood, first of all, to how to design the startup procedure or how to do the pretreatment procedure even before you start up the reaction. And then also, once you get out here, uh, Obviously, you'd like to extend the life of your catalyst. In a commercial reactor, you're talking uh, about a million dollars worth of catalyst or more. If you can extend that uh, catalyst lifetime by six months, by a year, or whatever, uh, you gain a lot. So you'd like to be able to regenerate this. In order to regenerate, you need to know how did it deactivate and what's the possibilities for regeneration. Now. I mentioned the importance of water vapor. 
These are, this is just the thermodynamic calculations for the simple system, bulk cobalt 304 uh, being reduced to cobalt metal. And in a system, you can see with uh, at different temperatures, here's 200 degrees, here's 400 degrees, and really uh, seldom, either in pretreatment or, or certainly on the reaction, do you go anywhere above these two, and, and on the reaction, you seldom go much above 200 and say 20, 230 degrees. And what you see is that uh, even if you have a water to hydrogen ratio uh, of eight or something like that, if you're at below 300 degrees centigrade or so, 90% uh, or more than 90% of your cobalt oxide should be in the reduced form, or uh, 90, more than 90% of your cobalt should be in the reduced metallic form. So you can have tons of water vapor there. If all you've got is cobalt metal or cobalt oxide, uh, you don't really have much of a worry. Unfortunately, because we need high surface area and we need to disperse this metal on that high surface area, and that high surface area comes from the support, we've got an added component, and that's where the problem uh, lies. Now, we've been uh, studying this over the last few years, and We've been wanting, as objectives, to develop a better understanding of cobalt support compound formation, in particular in cobalt alumina catalyst, although we have done a little bit of work on cobalt on silica as well. Uh, we also want to uh, determine what effect, if any, having a noble metal promoter there had on this uh, uh, support compound formation, and then to try to identify the so-called cobalt quote unquote, illuminate. I'll be talking uh, about two types of catalysts. One is a cobalt on gamma alumina, 20% uh, cobalt. The other one is identical to that, except that instead of just having cobalt, it has a half a weight percent of ruthenium as well, and the loading of the cobalt is 20 weight percent. Uh, all these catalysts are prepared by incipient wetness impregnation, followed, followed by a calcination at about 300 degrees, and then either I'll be talking about the calcine catalyst and what we do to that, or I'll be talking about after standard reduction, and standard reduction is a hydrogen reduction at 350 degrees centigrade for 10 hours. Uh, and later on, I'll be talking about doing it with and without added water vapor. Uh, passivation will be a 5% oxygen in helium, and that will just be so we can handle the cap. Now, some, first I'm going to just show you a little bit of background uh, based on the work that we published in Journal of Catalysis uh, in 1999. And this is a uh, bulk uh, cobalt 304, a cobalt oxide powder, no support. And this is doing TPR either without water vapor added or with three weight percent, or sorry, three volume percent added to the, the hydrogen stream or the hydrogen uh, argon stream that was being used for the and basically what you see is that during TPR, uh, here you get the sort of classic shape uh, for cobalt 304 reduction. Uh, it's been suggested or been pretty well proven now that the early part of this reduction is the reduction of cobalt 304 to cobalt oxide, that is COO. And then the second peak is the reduction of that to the metal. And you often don't see the split, but if you add water vapor, it changes the kinetics of the program reduction process, flows down the second reduction enough to cause a split and you separation of these two peaks, and then you can clearly see them. But adding water vapor to the reduction of cobalt oxide, yeah, it flows it down in, in a program reduction scheme, but other than that, you get reduction, 100% reduction. There's no difficulty whatsoever. Uh, 
by about 400 degrees centigrade. Now, this was the spectra that we published at that time and uh, still holds. And again, this is not the catalyst after a set of reduction. This is taking the calcite catalyst and reducing it in the TPR, but adding different amounts of water vapor and seeing what happens. And basically, going from zero added, and with zero added, you can assume that any given time during the flow, that essentially the partial pressure of water vapor that this catalyst sees is close to zero, uh, up to the maximum of about 21% uh, water vapor was added. So what you see is that this is the classic shape of cobalt ruthenium on alumina. And this is typically related to the reduction of the ruthenium, which then aids the reduction of the cobalt. And then this is a higher temperature cobalt species, probably some sort of cobalt oxide interacting with the alumina, but reducible still. And so what you see with adding water vapor during the temperature reduction process is that this peak stays pretty much the same, but this peak shifts to much higher temperature indicating that you're getting more interaction with the support. Now, spectra like this look interesting, but what's more important is what is the amount of reduction that you're able to achieve during this process. And this is the cumulative reduction. And what you see is that there's a certain amount of cobalt that is fairly easily reduced, perhaps 30 to 40 percent, and even with a large amount of water vapor, it reduces within uh, some 50 degrees uh, temperature range. However, with more water vapor, what happened was that the maximum reducibility of this catalyst went down uh, over the range up to 900 degrees centigrade. So whereas you can get 98 to 100% of the cobalt reduced in a, in a regular catalyst without water vapor, when you add the water vapor, even up to 900 degrees, you can only reduce about 60% of the catalyst. So again, this clearly shows that you've made something that is not reducible even up to 900 degrees. And what we always call that missing component here is cobalt aluminate. Uh, this is just a different version of it, and this is a citation to anybody like to, well, some of you have already read it, so uh, you know where it is. Um, anyway, this sort of visually shows most of this uh, blue is very easily reducible, but even some of the yellow is reducible under a standard reduction. Now, this says from 400 to 750 degrees, but if you sit at 350 degrees long enough, you'll reduce a lot of uh, of this uh, material. So actually, if you do a standard reduction on a typical catalyst like this, you'd actually get about 80% uh, or so reduction, and that would decline over here to probably something less than 50%. Now, giving up, um, although cobalt is certainly not a noble metal, it's not a cheap metal either, and giving up a significant quantity to never being able to use it is not something that you want to do in a commercial situation. So anything you can do to prevent or to avoid the formation of that uh, uh, cobalt aluminate, uh, the better. Now, in the rest of the slides, I'll be talking about the more recent work. And, and this will be the nomenclature that will be used that you'll see time and time again. Uh, C will stand for a calcine catalyst, RP will stand for reduced and passivated, and RWP, uh, again, it's the reduction in the presence of three uh, volume percent of water vapor, uh, and that will be a key because you'll see the impact that it has on this uh, uh, cobalt aluminate formation. Uh, the designation for just the plain cobalt on alumina is just cobalt, and cobalt with any obviously promoted catalyst. A uh, whole host of characterization techniques that I will 
mention as we go along. Now, first of all, uh, you might assume that if you start pre-treating catalysts with a lot of water vapor prop uh, around that you might get some sort of uh, recrystallization of the alumina and you might get loss of surface area. Uh, this is just to say that yes, you lose some surface area when you put a lot of cobalt on it because it's blocking up pores obviously. But once it doesn't matter how you pre-treat or post-treat the catalyst, you pretty well get the same overall surface area. So you really can assume that the alumina is not changing structure in any way that you have to worry about. Now, uh, the next I'm going to show you a lot of TPR. And this TPR has been done either after the catalyst was in the calcine state, or where it was reduced and then recalcined in order to do the TPR. Uh, for reference, this is what cobalt 304 looks like. Now, uh, first series I'll show you is the calcine, uh, just plain vanilla catalyst cobalt. Uh, and this is very typical of what you see. Uh, you often see the small peak at the lower temperature, and in a moment I'll come back and uh, identify that. And then what you see if you do a reduction of the catalyst, of the calcine catalyst, recalcine it and put it back in the oxide form and then do TPR again, is you've lost this peak, and now you see these two peaks here. Okay. And these are the standard two that you will see in a, a cobalt on alumina catalyst, a low temperature peak around 300 degrees, and then a high temperature peak somewhere up around 5 to 700 degrees. And if you look at these two, this pink one and the green one, uh, they look pretty much the same. But what's important is not how they look, it's what you do when you integrate them and you find out how much, were you able, how much cobalt were you able to uh, remove during this time. Now let me, before I move on from here, address this peak. Because uh, it's been related to, uh, by a number of people, including ourselves, to the decomposition of residual nitrate on the catalyst. And in fact, that's a pretty huge peak. There has been some evidence for that because if you hook up a mass spectrometer to the TPD system, you will actually see some nitrogen coming off. However, I don't think the amount that comes off can possibly be related to decomposition of cobalt nitrate. Here is some comparisons. This is x-ray diffraction of cobalt 304. There's a typical spinel uh, structure there. This is the x-ray diffraction pattern for cobalt nitrate. This is the catalyst right after you impregnate it and dry it with cobalt nitrate. And what you will see is even at, at drying at 100 degrees, you start forming the cobalt 304. And that's the pattern that you see there. And then after the calcination, you see uh, complete, well, largely the structure of cobalt 304. There's also a little bit of structure of alumina there. There is never any evidence by X-ray diffraction for any cobalt nitrate. Now, you might say, well, cobalt. Uh, X-ray diffraction requires large crystals, and that might be a good reason. It's highly dispersed. Uh, Raman spectroscopy also can identify. Here's cobalt nitrate. That's the way it looks in Raman. Here is cobalt 304, and here's the dried catalyst, and here's the calcine catalyst. Again, the only thing you ever see is cobalt 304. So. Considering how large that peak was, and very often you will see that when you run it, it is probably due to some highly dispersed form of cobalt that reduces at a relatively low temperature. And it's not due to a decomposition of cobalt nitrate. Um, now let me go back to this because 
present sort of an aside for those of you who are working on this um, more than for the majority of you. The next thing up are the cobalt ruthenium series. And this is a typical spectra that you will get uh, for cobalt ruthenium on aluminum. And again, the peak has shifted now to a lower temperature uh, than what you see down here, except obviously this strange peak here. And that's again due to ruthenium reducing and then reducing very fast the cobalt. Here's the high temperature peak, but it's located 3, 350 degrees centigrade. If I just do a standard reduction and then redo the TPR after calcination, I get pretty much the same thing. A little bit of this peak maybe comes down and this one increases, looks like a little bit. But if I reduce the catalyst in the presence of water vapor, notice the shift in the peak to the higher temperature, much like what happened when we did TPR in the presence of water vapor. Now, um, these nice spectra are so, so good, if you will, but what's more important is how much was I able to reduce. And here is what you see. If I do a TPR of a typical cobalt calcine catalyst to 900 degrees, I can typically get 83% reduction. The amount that's reduced between 30 and 400 degrees centigrade, which is in some ways related to what you get in a standard reduction, is 58% reduced. If I reduce, recalcine and reduce again, I lose a lot of reducibility. And that probably relates to uh, things such as the generation of water during the reduction step that increases the interaction of the cobalt with the aluminum. And so even up to 900 degrees, I only get up to somewhere 58 to 60% reduced. If I add water vapor during that, and only three, weight per, uh, sorry, three volume percent, which is not a lot of water vapor, this even decreases more. Now, if I promote the catalyst with ruthenium, again, I can get a very high reduction to 900 degrees, uh, 98%. If I'm just talking about up to 400 degrees, uh, which would be more like a standard reduction, I can get 69, 70%. If I do the reduction prior to the TPR, the reduction and followed by another calcination to get it back in the oxide. That cuts it down a bit, but not anywhere near as what you see up here. However, if I add water vapor, I, I still cut it down even more. So the reducibility still goes down. If I now look at the hydrogen chemical, because basically hydrogen chemisorption will track the catalytic activity of this catalyst for fission growth uh, almost perfectly. Uh, this is the amount adsorbed in total amount. And as you see, uh, if you re reduce the catalyst uh, uh, with the absence of water vapor, you get a much higher coverage by hydrogen than if you uh, reduce it in the presence of water vapor. The same thing happens in the case of the ruthenium promoted catalyst, but to a lesser degree. You always have better dispersion. And here's the overall metal dispersion. Uh, basically, 5.7% of the catalyst, uh, or 5.7% or, or of the cobalt is in the form of surface metal atoms, uh, as opposed to if in the presence of water vapor during the reduction, you drop that significantly. The same thing happens, although a little bit less of a loss when you've got ruthenium present, you still lose some surface area. Particle size is still what you would expect, that is, you're getting much larger particles, and this is corrected with, uh, re with the uh, percent reducibility results. Uh, so you're getting roughly 15 to 20 uh, nanometer size particles, cobalt particles, and they're much larger when you uh, reduce the catalyst in the presence of water vapor. Having ruthenium present there, you get a lot more dispersion of the catalyst and you get a lot 
smaller particle size as measured by hydrogen hemisorption. Now what I'm going to show you on these following view graphs are uh, SEM photographs. Uh, SEM in some ways uh, is can give us a lot of information about what the catalyst looks like. Of course, it's dealing at a different uh, magnification, if you will, than the hydrogen chemisorption. The chemisorption is penetrating down to whatever adsorbs hydrogen. Uh, and, and of course, we've already said, the reduced metal particles are probably pretty small on the order of uh, 10 nanometers or so. Uh, the resolution uh, will be different for different view graphs, but certainly, uh, is much larger, uh, or smaller, mag uh, how should I say, less magnified than, than the kinds of structures you're seeing with hydrogen chemistry. This is what the particles look overall. This is cobalt on a spray-dried, uh, well, spray-dried boimite, which has been calcined to give you gamma alumina. Surprisingly, it's not in a spherical form, uh, but this catalyst is highly resistant to attrition in a slurry bubble column. Looking at higher magnifications, you start seeing differences between the cobalt catalyst and the cobalt ruthenium catalyst. These large uh, bright structures are actually uh, cobalt structures. Now, they're obviously not single particles of cobalt, they are clusters of cobalt particles or whatever because we do have a reasonable dispersion of these catalysts. But you can see that there are the, a lot of large structures that are uh, even several microns across. This is the calcine catalyst and you can, you can see for the uh, unpromoted catalyst, uh, again, very large structures. The, with the promotion of ruthenium, you now see some of the impact of ruthenium about helping to disperse the catalyst, or disperse the cobalt, and you see much smaller uh, structures uh, spread all over the exterior surface of the catalyst granule. This is the catalyst after reduction, and of course, we're looking at different particles, so they'll look a little bit different, but there is some reduction in the size of these uh, patches of cobalt Will, but still, pretty large structures spread around, much smaller on the cobalt ruthenium. Now, <clears throat> where it becomes more interesting is when you look at a cobalt catalyst, and now we're focusing down much closer to the surface, so we're not seeing the edges of the granules, we're, we're actually just seeing a small portion of granule surface. Here are the cobalt structures on this uh, reduced and passivated cobalt catalyst. And you see some large ones, and you also see some small ones there. If you do the reduction in the presence of water vapor, you see much less of these small ones. And we see this over and over again when we look at multiple samples and multiple particles. So again, suggesting that the water vapor had something to do with the smaller structures and maybe less so with the larger structures. Now, could it have caused the centering of the smaller structures to larger structures, or could it have caused the atoms in this, uh, these cobalt structures to somehow diffuse into the alumina? You can't tell from the picture. This same thing uh, happens, uh, perhaps, although it's not as clear when you deal with the reduced uh, cobalt ruthenium catalyst. Uh, again, you see some, some fairly large uh, cobalt structures here and also some fairly small ones. Seems like when you have water vapor present during the reduction, you definitely get some larger cobalt structures. Now, uh, there seems to also be some small, uh, smaller cobalt structures, but it does look, when you look at enough of these, that the amount has decreased. One other interesting thing we can do uh, when doing SEM is uh, EDAX. Um, this is a cross-section of a catalyst granule. 
And again, you see in this cross-section, uh, you see uh, this is a number of particles embedded in epoxy and, and cleave. Uh, what you see here is, of course, a lot of the, the, the cobalt structure spread out. And so when you do an elemental mapping, the oxygen alumina uh, or aluminum, not aluminum, alumina distributions, aluminum distributions. But uh, that's to be expected. It's spread over because most of this material is aluminum. But what's more important is to look at the cobalt distribution. And as you can see here for the calcium and cobalt catalyst, that the cobalt is pretty uniform throughout the particle of this, uh, this granule. And that's true as we sample multiple ones. If we go and do a reduction now, again, the cobalt distribution is pretty evenly spread throughout the granule. And so, again, this makes sense if you think that the cobalt uh, interacts a lot with the alumina uh, and, and therefore is not moving around a lot. And when you look at, in the presence of water vapor, you don't see anything different, really. Uh, if you look at the granule cross-section, again, the cobalt distribution across this is pretty this is the unpromoted cobalt. Here is the calcine cobalt ruthenium catalyst. Looks like the cobalt catalyst, basically. Again, cross-section, you can see, just by the SEM picture, you can see a lot of cobalt structure. And here is the uh, elemental mapping. And of course, you see it's pretty evenly distributed in the calcine state. <coughs> Now we reduce it in a essentially zero partial pressure of water vapor. Because remember, we're dealing with a micro reactor with a high flow rate. So this is as close to zero partial pressure. Of course, in the pores, it's not zero, but it's, it should be fairly small. And what you see is something different. And this is what you see on, on uh, you know, if you look at 10 of these, you'll see the same thing. And that is, during the reduction of the cobalt ruthenium, it appears that a significant portion of the <laughs> cobalt can migrate towards the outer surfaces. This is, would be the outer surface of the granule. And you can confirm that. Uh, this is just uh, looking at the uh, electron view graph, but if you look at the elemental mapping from EDAC, you see the same thing. This might make sense because, again, the ruthenium helps in reducing the catalyst, uh, decreases, you know, you can get a higher reducibility, so there's less interaction with the alumina, so it maybe makes sense that it moves out. However, if you add water vapor to this, now what you see is it doesn't move out. And that fits in with what you see with the increased interaction with the alumina, the decrease in the reducibility, and you've tied it down. Now, have you tied it down in a good form? Uh, that's a question to be asked. Uh, if it's cobalt aluminate, it's no good to you. Uh, certainly, it's better dispersed in the, in the classic sense of dispersion, but it may not be in the, in the good catalytic sense of dispersion. Well. Basically, what we've seen up until now is that water vapor has a tremendous impact on the reducibility of the catalyst, that there is a significant portion of the catalyst that can't be reduced, even if you go to 900 degrees, and especially if you add water vapor, or if there's a high concentration of water vapor present during reduction. But this still doesn't answer the question, what is this stuff? You know, I mean, we can call it quote unquote aluminate, but is it aluminate? Is it cobalt, is it traditional, is it standard compound cobalt aluminate that you can look up or whatever? Here's a busy slide and um, showing you a whole bunch of things. 
I'll just basically walk you through it, and, and it'll be pretty simple what's going to be the, uh, the end result of this. This is x-ray diffraction of, of cobalt aluminate, and it's in a spinel form. And x-ray diffraction for cobalt aluminate spinel looks just like CO304, which is also spinel. Uh, it has peaks in essentially location, the same location. This is the spectra for cobalt oxide, COO, and this is the spectrum for gamma alumina. Now, if you look at all these x-ray diffraction patterns for these catalysts, if you look at the calcine catalyst, what you see basically is cobalt 304 overlaid on alumina. Well, yeah, so what? I mean, that's what you would expect. When you reduce the catalyst, uh, what you do is you reduce um, the cobalt 304, and what you can see by x-ray diffraction, you don't see any more cobalt 304, but you do see the basically uh, some of the, 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 the peaks or whatever for gamma alumina, and you see the evidence for cobalt oxide, cobalt. Uh, you can't see cobalt metal because it's spread out underneath the same peaks that the alumina is generating, and it's highly dispersed, and so it's, there's a lot of line drawing. So you never typically see uh, reduced cobalt metal on these cats. Now, if we add water vapor or we don't add water vapor, it really doesn't matter. That's all we're going to see. And even though these catalysts are passivated, uh, if there is cobalt 304 present on the surface of the metal, it's so thin that you can't pick it up by x-ray diffraction. So basically, as uh, I believe uh, some of uh, uh, the audience have already found, with x-ray diffraction, uh, it doesn't help you much in the identification of these uh, illuminate species. And it's unfortunate because what you'd like to do is take the catalyst out of a slurry reactor and do something without having to clean it up significantly in order to characterize it. Uh, and, and certainly with x-ray, you wouldn't have to really clean the catalyst at all. You can take it out in wax and, and look at it. So unfortunately, for all of us, x-ray diffraction doesn't tell us much or can't see anything. But there is something that can, and that is Raman spectroscopy. Okay, down here for comparisons, this is what cobalt aluminate looks like. This is the standard compound, the spinel, uh, in the Robin spectrometer. This is what cobalt 304 looks like, which now looks different, obviously, from the cobalt aluminate. This is what cobalt oxide, COO, looks like, which actually in, in the, the Raman spectrum for it looks pretty much uh, similar to cobalt 304. So that's what we'll be comparing to these. Now, here is uh, the calcine catalyst, uh, both the cobalt catalyst and the cobalt ruthenium catalyst. And what you see with Robin is basically cobalt 304. And you know it's there, and you can see it there, and it's pretty clear that's what it is. Uh, Maybe there could be some cobalt aluminate there, but you, could, you, you can't tell any difference because it looks just like cobalt uh, 304. If we do go through the reduction, it looked like you've lost all of this, so it looked like you've lost, uh, you certainly lost the cobalt 304 that you don't see anymore. Um, you really don't even see much in the way of cobalt oxide. Uh, and this would almost look like a fairly flat curve, but it turns out that it's not, and I'll show you some plot in a little bit different ways to uh, exacerbate it a little more. You really see it when we add water vapor to the reduction. So these are the uh, reduced and under free uh, volume percent water uh, vapor, and then passivated and looked at with almond. And now you see the peaks that are characteristic of what I'll try to convince you is cobalt, quote unquote, eliminate. Now, here is 
is a, a sort of blow up, if you will, of the region of importance. The top curve is what cobalt aluminate bulk compound looks like. And if you can see just from this one right below it, the peaks are nowhere near the same place. What you see here is that even in a very low partial pressure, although one can argue not zero partial pressure of water vapor, because you do have a porous material, and no matter how much we flow gas through the system, we're not going to decrease the partial pressure of water vapor in the pores to zero. Uh, you will actually see that there is some structure here that is like this up here. And what you see is that if I just look at the bottom two, which is simply reduced to minimal water, the cobalt catalyst, without the ruthenium promoter, has more of this compound than the one with ruthenium. That's harder to see, and, and if you didn't do the other experiments, you know, you'd say, well, you know, you're dreaming, or you know, what you're seeing there, you're just uh, imagining the peaks in there. Um, you can certainly see it much better where you put in more water vapor. And we didn't put in a lot. Three, three volume percent is not a huge partial pressure. This is atmospheric pressure. Uh, but you can, again, clearly see that without the ruthenium, you got much more, uh, much larger illuminate peaks, if you will, than you have when you have the ruthenium present. However, with ruthenium present, you still have some. This is just a, a comparison so you can see a little closely. This is again comparing the cobalt catalyst where you essentially had zero partial pressure of water vapor, very small, and with certainly uh, at least three volume percent. And you can see the big impact of water vapor on this species. then sum up our conclusion. Water vapor uh, has a uh, significant impact on cobalt supported on gamma alumina by increasing the amount of non-reducible cobalt illuminate, cobalt quote unquote illuminate. There's some evidence, uh, and, and this is true with uh, uh, you do a, put water vapor around when it's, you're doing TPR or whether you do a standard reduction with water vapor added. And my guess, if we add more than 3% water vapor, we're going to get even more. Uh, they may be, if you look at the TPR study, there may be some uh, uh, sort of minimal re reduction level that you, you will keep with the catalyst for whatever reason, but um, uh, it certainly looks like you can lose more than you'd ever want to lose. It also appears that the water vapor may enhance uh, the migration rate of cobalt atoms, uh, possibly along the surface to cause sintering, and highly likely to uh, help or assist in the migration uh, rate of cobalt atoms into the surface of the alumina. This cobalt aluminate that's formed is not identical to the spinel cobalt aluminate uh, and probably exists as some sort of surface compound, highly non-stoichiometric, and certainly does not have any spectra that look like uh, cobalt aluminate uh, from the bulk standpoint. It would appear that highly dispersed cobalt may be more susceptible to formation of this cobalt aluminate, and in some ways that's very bad because we struggle a lot in the preparation of the catalyst to get highly dispersed cobalt. But we may be setting ourselves up for 
deactivation down, downstream, if you will, either through the reduction or through the deactivation process under the reaction conditions. The promotion with ruthenium, while it does not prevent, prevent the formation of cobalt aluminate, it certainly seems to decrease the impact of water vapor uh, by e what exact mechanism uh, we don't know yet. One thing that we know from the study with cobalt um, silica was that cobalt oxide on silica does not react in the presence of hydrothermal conditions to form cobalt silicate. Uh, you can heat it, you can pass a, a helium stream uh, with a high water partial pressure in it, and you don't get formation of cobalt silicate. But once you introduce hydrogen and you start the reduction, it appears that either the cobalt oxide, COO, or more likely cobalt, uh, metallic cobalt, is reactive in the presence of water vapor with not only silica, probably also with aluminum. Now, um, obviously, what we need to, um, to do in order to have highly active catalysts, we want to reduce as large an amount of cobalt as possible. We would also like to have the cobalt in as high a dispersed state as possible in order to get the most activity per uh, kilogram of catalyst. Um, and we're somewhat limited because how can we do this or how can, if we know that, that getting high dispersions is going to hurt us when we have high partial pressures of water vapor, well, you might say, well, let's decrease the amount of water vapor that we have present. But how do we do that when we are, A, trying to reduce a commercial quantity of catalyst, if we're trying to reduce at one time 10,000 pounds of catalyst, it's pretty hard to keep the water partial pressure down close to zero. So that's one side of the coin. What can we do uh, under reduction conditions to minimize this formation? But we got another question that we have to answer, and there's work already going on here at CAER about this, and that is, when you start the reaction, you don't want to run at 1% conversion. That's fine in a differential reactor doing a fundamental study. But if you really aim towards developing a catalyst for commercial operation, you've got to carry out the reaction at high conversions. And certainly 80% conversion is not uh, unusually high. So at 80% conversion, you're going to be generating a huge amount of water. And in some ways, you might say it's surprising the catalyst doesn't totally deactivate with that amount of water present. Now, possibly some of the understanding of this phenomena comes from comparing what happens under reducing conditions versus what happens under reaction. Why would a catalyst not deactivate totally or, or two-thirds or something in a reaction? And it may be tied to the composition of the gas phase or uh, the presence, if you will, of CO in the reactor. And it may be that the CO helps to uh, at least provide competition for reabsorption of water vapor or whatever that might contribute to some of the, the problems that we have here. Um, but obviously, uh, I'm not going to say that you can't run the current generation of catalysts commercially because some of them are already being run. The question is, how can we improve on this? And certainly, there are areas of improvement that are, are both in the pretreatment conditions and the composition of the pretreatment gas, as well as the formulation of the catalyst, probably for the application in the, uh, in the reaction itself, where you sustain high uh, partial pressures of uh, water vapor. So, uh, currently we have some ongoing research actually to address the issue of the impact of composition of the, of the gas uh, during the reduction and what you might 
be able to add to that reducing gas that may uh, decrease the formation of things like cobalt eliminate. Finally, I'd like to uh, close by acknowledging uh, uh, financial support of uh, the two students by the Royal Thai government and also uh, preparation of these catalysts by Energy International uh, in Pittsburgh. I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. It seems like XRD doesn't help very much. Have you tried XPS to identify the... Uh, uh, we, we haven't done any XPS yet. Um, there have been some uh, work done years ago by Dave Hercules uh, with some cobalt on alumina catalyst. Uh, there are some interesting things, like for instance, uh, there may be some initial amount of cobalt when, that you put on the catalyst that gets sacrificed. That really uh, may be anywhere from one to two or three percent of the of the initial loading uh, reduces into the alumina, and you can never reduce it uh, anyway. There's some interesting results in that direction. So I didn't see the first part of the presentation uh, on the reactivity studies. I don't know if you talked about that. When you add the ruthenium, you increase reducibility. What is the side of the, the effect on reactivity? Uh, uh, it's, it's exactly what you might expect because with the added ruthenium, you get a higher dispersion, and when you uh, put these catalysts uh, into a reactor to test them, um, uh, what you'll find is that, that their um, activity will track the difference in the dispersion. And uh, it's about, uh, I don't know, maybe almost close to double uh, the cobalt ruthenium catalyst. In a, uh, let's say if you do it in a micro reactor where you can limit some of these uh, issues of deactivation. The, uh, you mean in terms of the ruthenium or? Right. I, and, and this is not only our work. I mean, pretty much everybody that's worked with cobalt uh, finds out that uh, the amount of noble metal that you put in there, and, and be it a fissiotropes active metal like ruthenium or a very poor uh, fissiotropes catalyst like uh, platinum, it really is there to help in reducing the cobalt and most of your active surface areas, the cobalt, the more of that you get, the more active the catalyst is. And uh, noble metal promotion, and again, any of the noble metals, uh, or including a non-noble metal, that is rhenium, will uh, assist in the early reduction of the cobalt and will assist in getting a high dispersion of We haven't done that yet. We just purchased a drift cell, and that might be something that we will do. Because, you know, if you ask yourself, how does what is the mechanism by which the water, I hate to use the term in this group, catalyzes the formation of cobalt aluminate, because it's not a catalysis. But, but um, uh, obviously, it may have to do with, uh, you know, hydroxylating the alumina, which makes it much more interactive. And, I mean, that would make the most sense, I think. So probably it, it's true that when you add the water vapor, you're going to see a lot more, a lot more uh, hydroxyl groups there than you normally see in the dry treatment. Now, uh, yeah, right. And even with those experiments, it still may be hard to say what is, you know, what is, uh, are the hydroxyl groups that you're seeing just spectators to what's going on, or are, are they actually participating in somehow the preparing of the alumina surface for forming the compound? 
the different uh, um, you know, techniques to determine the cluster size of uh, cobalt. Do you have like idea the cluster size, how, how big is that for the 20% uh, cobalt alumina and the 0.5 ruthenium promoted one? Well, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, well, if you, you know, if you go by hydrogen chemisorption, yes. uh, these would be somewhere around uh, 10 nanometers up to about 20 nanometers. Um, yeah, you know, it'd be nice to look at it with CEM, but with 28 percent cobalt, uh, it's pretty opaque. So uh, even with with thinning uh, and microtoming, you don't see very much. Uh, yeah. I think most of the work, and, and some of this goes to uh, what um, uh, Cal Bartholomew did and Gabor Samajai uh, uh, in trying to determine, or maybe it was Wayne Goodman, I can't remember, but I think it was Gabor. Uh, you know, basically, fissiotrope seems like a pretty uh, structure insensitive reaction. Maybe it's not surprising since with all that water vapor there, it probably restructures everything to whatever it want, you know, wants it to be thermodynamically. But, um, uh, and, and so uh, there's never been a lot of indication that particle size has a major impact on reactivity. Um, that's why typically turnover frequencies tend to be the same uh, with different loadings and all. But is that like a particle size, the cluster size is to different cluster sizes. Yeah. Obviously, in the SEM, and again, that's a uh, low resolution compared to what Tian would show us, but you, you certainly see evidence for a disappearance of some of the smaller structures. Now, you know, there's no proof in what you see there that that's, that disappearance couldn't be just due to centering. Given the fact that you've formed more aluminate, it makes sense that maybe those structures have been the ones that were more apt to react with uh, the support and, and form the aluminate. So we don't have a proof, but you know it, it makes sense. The smaller the structure is probably more susceptible to forming, uh, carrying out the reaction. The calcined, the calcined um, samples show no evidence of that uh, illuminate or whatever, that compound. But, but this is what I'm saying. I think for your experiments uh, or, and those of others here, uh, where you're running the reaction for long term in a, in a uh, CSTR, it really suggests, you know, if you take those catalysts out now and without having to clean them up with socks like extraction and all the other things that you normally have to do and take those catalysts to a Raman spectrometer, I think you, you may start seeing some differences, especially uh, if you started with an unpromoted cobalt catalyst, that is, without the platinum or the ruthenium or whatever, because it's even worse there. You know, water vapor increases the amount of aluminate formation. Ruthenium promotion, and I would assume by extrapolation, platinum promotion, probably decreases that effect. It doesn't get rid of it totally, but it decreases the effect. Would somebody argue that because, you know, with
there is a is a way to uh, to also look at this, and and we're getting around to doing some of these experiments. Uh, obviously, the metallic cobalt you can strip off very easily with acid. So if you do an acid leaching, you can knock everything off that's not really part of the alumina structure probably. And this might enhance your ability to see this eliminate. Uh, and we haven't done it yet. We, we've done a lot of leaching studies with our uh, iron attrition studies, uh, but we haven't applied it in this case. And, and really, this, this sort of begs it for it because, again, the alumina shouldn't be shouldn't be damaged, and probably the, the, the cobalt aluminate will stay behind as well. Uh, there's no possibility of uh, alumina uh, to form other forms of alumina. Uh, what do you mean by other forms of alum <laughs> aluminate? Uh, I don't even know what I'm talking about about this <laughs> aluminate, so <laughs> it covers already a, a, a very big village of, of possible aluminates. Uh, say that in, in x-ray we don't, I mean, we don't really see any other uh, forms of alumina and we've calcined it under condition. This is a Vista B alumina, started out as Boimai, was calcined at 600, should be in the gamma form, looked like the gamma form from x-ray. Could there be some small amount of other stuff if it's below detectability limit? Anything is possible. 